All right, good afternoon. I'm Rona Lichioko from the Connecting Com Communicate Series Planning Committee. Thanks for joining us today. Um, as Erin was just saying, our presentation will be recorded and made available on the College and Research Division blog and sent to everyone who registered. This session is brought to you by the College and Research Division Board of the Pennsylvania Library Association. I'd like to thank the CRD Board for supporting the Connect and Communicate initiative. If you're not part of the Pennsylvania Library Association but live in Pennsylvania, please consider joining PALA for more great programs and initiatives. Our panelists today, Danya Liebu, Liebu and Alexis Logston, will be speaking about academic freedom for academic librarians. Do we have it and how do we know? Many academic librarians think that <clears throat> they are protected by academic freedom policies, but is that really true? They conducted a survey in 2018 collecting information from hundreds of librarians on their experiences with academic freedom. In this session, they will highlight key findings, including how academic freedom experiences correlate to socioeconomic identities and job status. They will also offer concrete suggestions for exploring your own existing academic freedom protections and ways to advocate for stronger ones. During the presentation, feel free to add questions to the chat box. I will make a list for our panelists. After their presentation, we will open up the floor for attendees to ask questions. So, um, Alexis and Danya, please go ahead. Great, thank you. So, um, I'm Danya Leba, and I am the uh, director of the Social Science and Professional Program Department at the University of Minnesota Libraries. I've been here for two years, and prior to this, I was a social sciences librarian at Carleton College for 10 years, and also worked at Emory University Libraries um, before that. I am excited to be here today because I got my library degree from the University of Pittsburgh mm -hmm. in 2006. So hello to any of you who might have been there at the same time or we might have crossed paths way back when. Um, and before that, I had a, a different career altogether in advertising. So I'll let Alexis introduce herself and then um, we'll get going. Hi, um, I'm Alexis Blogsden. I'm the Humanities Research and Digital Scholarship Librarian at the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities. Um, I've worked here for a little bit over a year. And prior to that, I worked at McAllister College in St. Paul for about five years. And Danya and I knew each other as both working at these small liberal arts colleges and then kind of not at the same time, but close together, moved over here to the university. So we've had similar interesting perspective, I think, on those two different kinds of institutions. Um, and before that, I did a lot of temporary and part-time and adjunct and internship and all kinds of very precarious positions in libraries, um, you know, before, during, well, mostly during and after my, my library degree. So um, I have that perspective as well. And I don't, I always say I, d I didn't have a career before this, but I kind of did because I was a, doctoral student in English literature and I decided not to continue down that path so I left with a master's degree but um, I kind of, it was like an almost academic and then kind of shifted paths so yeah I'm really excited to be here I don't have a connection to Pennsylvania other than that one of my best friends is a nurse in Pittsburgh and I really love Pittsburgh so <laughs> <laughs> so um Today, Alexis and I are going to be sharing, we've, we're on, I think, year three of our research project into academic freedom for academic librarians, and it's, we've followed a lot of different paths as we've worked on this, um, but today we're pick, particularly excited because we're, we're we were excited to be invited and using the opportunity to, to begin a conversation that we have been hoping to have, which is um, taking the research and some of the work that we've been doing in this area and thinking through what that might mean for individual academic library workers and how they can apply some of what we've been, um, the conversations that we've been trying to start and engage in, how those can be applied for all of you. So um, this is the first that we've been exploring that more publicly, but we're excited to hear your questions and feedback. Um, so our, um, and our, let me know please via chat or somebody let me know if things are not advancing or the slides are not lining up, but um, our, just briefly that we will be, our slides are shared at this link and um, we are linking to the paper that we wrote for ACRL last year. Um, it is, we, 
we have another publication in the works right now and hopefully more after that, but that paper does contain some more details and some of our literature review and other information that, um, that you probably will find relevant. So again, what we're hoping to do today, we'll start with a very, very brief, um, probably oversimplistic overview of um, academic freedom and academic librarianship to kind of frame what we're talking about today, and then get into the hypotheses and, and research project that we've been working on with some broader, some of our more broad findings, um, takeaways, and then wrap up, like I was saying, with, um, with some thoughts and suggestions about individual librarians and library workers and what um, what we can all do together and what you might do on your campus. So speaking of academic freedom more generally, um, the modern concept of academic freedom in the United States is really only about a century old. Um, it, it, it lacks a universally accepted definition and it's been regularly challenged over the past century. So this is a contested area, um, not just for librarians, but in general and, um, and for academics. Um, the A American Association of University Professors 1940 statement is still the standard definition behind many institutional policies. Um, and that contained three main um, tenets, which is the right to freely publish and research, the freedom to speak on one's area of expertise in and outside the classroom, and um, freedom from institutional discipline. Ultimately, it's important to remember that academic freedom is and has always been um, dependent on institutional policy and one's own inclusion or exclusion from those policies. And I see a, something in the chat here about the slides need to require permission to view. Um, so we will share those and make sure that those are done. Um, so um, academic librarians, we, um, we kind of have a, this foot in academia and a foot in librarianship, but our situation really resides in a liminal space in between, um, which we think is a really interesting um, uh, framing for how we think about this. So for the academic librarians with faculty-like status, which um, because our status is so heterogeneous among the different institutions that we're a part of, it's pretty hard to establish an ex like a really rigorous figure in this regard, but it's usually about considered to be less than half. Um, we might be protected by AAUP advocacy and or institutional policies, um, but many of us are not. Our own professional home of ALA and ACRL um, are loosely committed to these principles. Um, and the reason I say loosely is that there are statements in support. I think it's generally supported, but, um, but there's definitely um, in our observation and our research, a lack of consensus on what um, our commitment to academic freedom means when challenges emerge. Um, and I think even more importantly, the focus of the profession has been dominated by protecting our users and our readers from censorship. Um, the focus on censorship and access to materials, um, all well and good in its own right, but it has complicated protections for librarians is a, a core argument that we make. And it's overshadowed academic freedom for academic librarians. So again, it's complicated. Sometimes our academic freedom is implicated in protecting the rights of our users, um, but sometimes it also can obs obstruct and kind of obscure the view of, of ourselves as workers. So Alexis and I have been um, studying and discussing academic freedom, um, as I mentioned, for several years now. Um, and that really for us started um, very soon after the 2016 presidential election. Um, uh, there was a lot of um, organizing at that time among librarians and a lot of reflection about our role um, as educators, our role in the public and civic engagement. Um, and we, um, and other things that happened around that time as well. And so we grew curious and began talking a lot to one another about not just academic freedom for librarians overall, but we also were thinking about how those policies or lack thereof translated to the lived experiences on the ground um, for librarians and how these varied for different identities within our profession. And all of those questions guided our research. 
So um, we decided to issue a survey to learn more, um, and those results are the basis for our paper and our talk today. And um, I'm not going to go into great detail here about our research methods. You can find more about that in our um, ACRL paper. But just generally, um, we talked about um, three main areas around academic freedom, so awareness, perceptions, and experiences. Um, and then we also asked for a number of different socioeconomic variables so that we can study those together. Um, and um, we also had room for open-ended comments. So a few caveats before um, I hand it over to Alexis to talk about our findings. Um, we're continuing to work with our data. We have a paper that will be um, that we're working on getting published right now that's on um, specifically honing in on the faculty status aspect of this and that variable. Um, what we're going to share today is a broad overview, um, but we do have different findings. We talked about some of them in our ACL ACRL paper about race um, and uh, financial situation and other factors that affect and kind of change how these academic freedom is experienced. Um, we also think it's really important to acknowledge our own positionality as white um, academic librarians at a large research university library. Alexis and I are both on the tenure track, but we don't have tenure yet. Um, and we have experiences, as Alexis mentioned, in other kinds of libraries and other less protected positions. So we're thinking of all that as we write and research. Um, and then probably the last important thing to note before I hand it over is we are calling all respondents academic librarians, um, even though some are not technically in a librarian role um, for the sake of simplicity. Most, most of our respondents were, but we certainly do not intend to erase the unique experiences of non-MLIS staff. And we are um, cognizant of that, and we are using that terminology just for the sake of being concise here. And with that, I will hand it to Alexis. Okay, um, and I'll just say next slide for you if that's okay. Yep. When, uh, sorry. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk about some of our survey results. Um, first, I'll just let you know that um, about 600 people completed the survey, which we administered late in the fall of 2018. Um, and we're going to give you a little brief overview of who the respondents were. Next slide, please. Um, so, first of all, in terms of the classification of folks' jobs, um, the vast majority, 90%, were, from, had, were in MLIS required positions. Um, over 60% were faculty or faculty-like in their status, and I want to emphasize that this was self-reported, self-identification, um, so it's totally possible for two people who say, like Danya and I, like as she mentioned, have these positions that are called continuous appointment track. Um, someone with that status, because we're staff, could think of themselves as staff, and they could think of themselves as faculty, depending on just per personal perception. So when we talk about perceptions amongst faculty or non-faculty, which happens a lot in our coming up paper, um, that is something that has to do with self-perception. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, when we asked about uh, labor law, if you were exempt from labor laws, I think the most striking um, um, thing on that one is that about a third of the people who responded weren't sure. And I'll just like, in case you're not sure, that generally speaking, it means that you're a salaried employee who doesn't get paid overtime. So you're exempt from overtime pay. Um, but I do think it's very interesting to think about how a lot of people don't actually know that much about like their rights, their status, that kind of stuff in their positions. Um, and I think that that will come into play when we talk about knowing more about your academic freedom. Um, about uh, about 60 percent were in, a, uh, or sorry, about uh, 30 something percent were in a supervisory role um, of over our staff other than just students. And um, about a third, a little less than a third, or, or about 28% were unionized employees. So it's a pretty good spread. I don't know if it totally reflects the, you know, the broadest picture of who is in libraries, but it is, you know, a, a really, it's a good selection of people across a lot of different statuses. Um, next slide, please. Um, and in terms of job function, like people came from all over the libraries. Um, 
re reference and instruction was the biggest category, which doesn't surprise us because you know our networks tend to be of R and I folks, and then but we did put this out in a lot of different areas, so we got a good number of tech services and um, IT digital scholarship folks, and then a lot of other people from different parts of the library. Next slide. Um, and then some of the just kind of basic questions that we asked in the survey, like, for example, is academic freedom important to you? 77% um, said it was very important to them, and 23% said it's somewhat important to them. Um, this is pretty much what we would have expected to see, just given that those who would probably complete a survey on academic freedom most likely have some interest in it or care about it to some degree. So this wasn't a very surprising one, but but very important, more than three quarters of the people, I think that is still, it's important to think about. Um, and then we asked if folks had policies about academic freedom in their institutions. And 61% um, said they did, but 34% um, said they weren't sure. Um, and I think that's really interesting to think about as well. And we'll, we'll talk more about that a little bit later, but I also wanna mention that we did not specify whether by my institution, we meant your library or your university. So that may account for some of the unsure. If people don't know, they might know that faculty are covered, but they don't really know if they are or not. But either way, it's a lot of people who don't really know um, what, their, what their protections are. Next slide. Um, so we asked a series of questions about how free academic librarians feel to express themselves in a variety of workplace scenarios and also in some of their non-work activities if that was to impact their work life. Um, and this is a pretty busy slide, so I'll give you a moment with it, but um, we asked about most functions that we could think of about people's work. Um, and the, the ones where you'll see um, people feeling um, there wasn't a single scenario where more than a third of respondents felt free to express themselves all of the time. Um, and collection development was the scenario with the most librarians feeling protected all of the time, which we feel aligns with what we saw as broad, we see as broad support for freedom to read initiatives like Danya mentioned earlier. Um, and then equally unsurprising maybe is that social media presence is where the highest number of people said they did not feel free. Um, and since this is a newer area where responsibilities and expectations and protections are still very unclear, it's not surprising that folks don't really feel protected there. But it is interesting because I think that as time goes on, more and more conversations within our profession are happening in those spaces. And it, it's interesting to think about the tension between the vulnerability of those spaces and how much um, stock we put in using them nowadays. So. Um, next slide. Um, we also asked people about whether or not they had been punished in their work um, as a result of speaking up or questioning policies or um, doing something that their superiors found controversial. Um, we asked about four possible punishment scenarios, um, informal punishment, um, redirection from um, activities um, on campus or a redirection from instruction and reference or other aspects of work and then finally formally punished um, such as being fired or demoted or written up uh, for questioning workplace policies and decisions. Um, the most common category of people to report having been punished was in the informal uh, penalization um, and um, there, um, we'll talk about this more in the next few slides, but informal punishments are damaging for a number of reasons um, related to workplace morale and are particularly likely to impact people of color librarians. Next slide, please. Um, so we also asked about the impacts that um, being punished had on people. Um, fewer people did respond to this section because you know, not everyone had experienced these punishments. Um, so this is directed just at those who had been experiencing those. Uh, we, had, we had these seven categories, um, mental well-being, physical well-being, motivation and engagement at work, 
ability to adequately do my job, relationships with coworkers and students, and sense that I belong in this profession. Um, the four that were um, that are in bold on this slide are the ones that were reported the most, and also where there was a really big disparity between white librarians and librarians or people of color. Um, next screen. Uh, so, so this is the overall results. Um, the motivation and sense of belonging were the biggest impacts, um, uh, and um, mental well-being and relationships were also really high. Um, but even amongst the lowest number areas here, um, there's still a fair number of people experiencing these impacts. So even though physical well-being is only like, you know, I don't know, what is that? 30-ish percent said somewhat or significantly, that's still kind of a lot of people. So it's certainly still um, um, a troubling number. Next slide. The numbers are quite a bit more troubling when you look at the impacts for folks who identified as any category other than white um, versus white librarians. The um, You can see that every single category here, um, the number, the, um, the green, the green bar being the people of color, uh, it's the mental well-being one is just, I mean, it's like 85%. Um, it's, and then uh, motivation and engagement, 83%. And then, you know, all of them were 40% or higher, right? And significantly higher than any of the other, um, than the other uh, category. So, um, and we think that this re resonates with research in the field um, on low morale in libraries and how that impacts people of color um, disproportionately. Um, and it's just something really important to think about. And now the next slide. And it's Danya. All right, so I'm going to unmute myself. Um, all right, so um, some of the we wanted to spend a little time on some of the key takeaways that Alexis and I are um, are finding from our work. Um, so on the simplest level, we confirmed our broad hypothesis that while academic freedom is very important to academic librarians, we aren't always clear if we have it or how it applies to us. We feel like that came through pretty loud and clear from our survey. Um, unsurprisingly, but still important to note, the most traditional areas of our work feel the safest. So things like collection development or if it applies to us, cataloging. So again, we think that's unsurprising, but we think that there are a lot of, um, a lot, there's a lot of food for thought in that as well. Um, so it's in emerging areas like social media, as Alexis was saying, or areas where we are having to make hard choices or take risks, like speaking up about workplace issues, which is a particular interest of ours in this study, um, or planning programming um, that librarians feel the least free to express themselves. Um, we just want to highlight that over one third of our respondents said that they had been informally penalized for questioning workplace policies. That's a pretty big number. And around 20% were directed not to participate in something at work or made to change their work in some way. Um, again, pretty high when you think about it. Um, for those who experience these infringements, morale and mental health is deeply affected. And so again, this ties into other research that's been happening in our field as well. And this is even more the case for non-white librarians. So based on our research, what can individual librarians do to better understand their own situation as far as academic freedom and advocate for themselves? So these are some of our thoughts in the slides that follow. We would be interested in hearing your ideas as well. We want to get our community thinking about this, helping one another out, and making this topic much more visible for our profession. We believe that if we created a share, if we create a shared understanding and common framing for what we are experiencing, that these isolated incidents are that they're part of a bigger issue and that they can be considered academic freedom violations, that we are better positioned to respond and organize together. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Alexis here and we'll kind of go back and forth a little bit in this um, part of our talk. 
<clears throat> yeah, so one of the first things um, we wanted to talk about with this is examining shared assumptions. Um, there are a lot of stories out there about um, people thinking that they had protections that they really didn't have um, and realizing that part of the reason why we didn't know is because we don't really talk about it that much. Um, and I think that some ways that you can kind of get at some of this is um, one of them is to pay attention to how faculty academic freedom cases are being handled. Um, uh, I'm thinking of some really big ones, one of them right in Pennsylvania, George Ciccarello Mayer, who was at Drexel. Um, he ended up not being fired, but he ended up leaving anyway because of um, the difficulties that being under such intense scrutiny brought to his life. But um, or someone like Steven Salida um, or Loria Garcia Pena, who was recently denied tenure at Harvard and the uproar around that. I think it's really interesting to see how faculty have rallied around their own um, and how can we learn from that. Um, and then to look within the profession, um, following stories from other libraries or library systems. So like some examples, you, many of you may have followed the story of the University of California librarians um, who were in part of their um, contract negotiation, they wanted to um, make sure that academic freedom, that their academic freedom was written into their contract because they that was just a really important part of it for them. Um, the university chancellors thought that was ridiculous. Like, they, why would librarians need academic freedom? So like, just right there, you have this moment of, whoa, okay, we think it's just obvious that we have it and we should have it. And then the people who are in charge are saying, no way in hell do you have it, right? I mean, like that's a really big disconnect right there. Um, and looking at what did, you know, how did they gain support? I mean, for one thing, well, we'll talk about this more, but like, you know, like looking to like professional organizations that were for faculty who saw that they absolutely should be protected and that that was, that there was no question that librarians were, were under this kind of broad category of people who should have academic freedom. Um, you could look at a story like um, last year, about a, almost exactly a year ago at Holland's College. Maybe you remember the story about the gubernatorial candidates in Virginia who were, um, like it turns out like all of them had blackface photographs in yearbooks somewhere, um, which started this whole, um, you know, people were starting to really look for that and looking through digitized yearbooks and um, a metadata librarian at Holland's College um, was asked to take down all the yearbooks from their digital repository and they said no. Um, and it became this whole thing that I don't know if it was ever even written about in the news, but it was all it was, the person who was involved in this was writing about it in real time on Twitter. Um, and ha they have saved that thread and have it pinned on their page. So you can probably go looking for it. I think it's a really interesting case to really look at how someone working in uh, digital, you know, like um, institutional repository um, uh, special collections and that kind of digital scholarship area um, who felt really strongly that this was within her um, academic freedom rights to defend keeping those things online um, and that even you know resisted uh, pressure from as high up as I think the college president but then the way it all kind of uh, turned out was really interesting so I'm just I'll let you look into it yourselves but I think it's interesting to think about that with the framework of academic freedom, because I'm not sure it was ever explicitly discussed in that way. Um, and then I'll finally just um, end with another story, which is actually about myself. Um, at my previous job, I was part of putting together a lab guide with two other colleagues um, about the Trump Syllabus 2.0, which was a, um, it was a, like a reading guide, basically a syllabus, one of those hashtag syllab syllabus um, by a black, scholars, mostly historians, who made this, you know, a 16-week course, basically, looking at how do we end up with in the, in the Trump era, right? Um, looking at immigration and labor movements and slavery and women's movements and looking at all of the ways that, you know, the things that, the struggles of the, of the, of the people, right? Um, but we just put down a gather, together a guide with the resources that were in that guide or in that syllabus. And, um, and there was pushback from our, some of our colleagues, but nobody stopped us from doing it. But then after a couple of months of it being up, 
um, some like an, a right wing um, student blog, which I'm not going to name, but a lot of you probably are familiar with, um, posted about it, made a big stink about it, and then eventually Fox News called our college, and then the president of the college told us to take the guy down. Um, and we did not have a choice. <laughs> there was no choice in the matter. Um, and that was the moment when I really realized, wow, we don't have academic freedom. And in fact, my boss said to me, like, no, we, we don't have that. You know, like it was just to her obvious that we didn't have it. So I want to I want to say that these are stories that I think would be really good to look at to like examine kind of where where do we where are we assuming things in common? Where do we diverge? How can we push that a little bit more in the direction of protection? Um, and just, you know, thinking about it through that lens instead of just as these like, you know, quiet little corners of things that are happening that we don't really know what to do with. Um, and the last thing I wanna say about that is that um, a lot of these stories, you have to really go seeking them out because a lot of times there's, there's a lot of silencing around this stuff and in fact, this, my example is the first time, I mean, it will be in our paper that's coming out soon, but that's the first time I've like publicly spoken about it because while I was still working there, I was really afraid that I would lose my job for talking about it. Um, and I think that that's something we have to think about too, the fact that people are feeling like they can't discuss these issues, right? Um, okay, so then a place that I would say that you could go looking for some of these stories if you're trying to find them is, um, the Office of Intellectual Freedom from ALA has a newsletter, and one of the um, categories in the newsletter is about academic, academic freedom. Um, it frequently features faculty academic freedom cases, but it also does have um, stuff that has to do with librarians sometimes. Um, and then search on Twitter for the librarian AF um, hashtag that was started from the UC librarians, and it's been used like we use it a lot, a lot of other people are using it. Um, it's a good way to get some of those stories. Um, and then also I was gonna say, like I think Inside Higher Ed does a pretty good job of talking about academic freedom, particularly for, um, they, they do cover non-faculty academic freedom issues, which I think is interesting. There's somebody named Joshua Kim, who frequently writes about, he's in, um, I think, educational technology um, and he talks about like the impeding, how it impedes his research to not be able to be critical about some of that stuff. So um, just, just a few places to look for, places to start conversations. So now we can go on. I think you're doing the yep. next one, right, Dania? Okay. Yep. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so um, another kind of broad area of, of um, suggestion slash advice that we would have is to know your local context. We we feel after everything that we've learned about and the examples that Alexis gave that um, it would behoove all of us to, including us, and we've been doing this in the last few years, to dig into um, to dig into our own situations. So while most librarians are well aware of their own job classification on their campuses, we think, and, and how that affects their work in all sorts of ways, it's something I think we've often talked a lot about amongst ourselves, we aren't always aware of what that means for our academic freedom rights. Um, so we feel that the heterogeneous nature of librarian stature on campus um, as compared to the pretty straightforward classifications for other workers like faculty and um, like many faculty and many um, clerical staff and other sorts of staff, other kinds of staff on campus, we think that that muddies the water for us. The fact that on any given campus, librarians occupy a slightly different status on the campus right next door and so on and so forth all across the country. Um, that really makes things murky and it makes it hard to wrap our heads around. Um, so this is a protection. I think it's just important to be aware that academic freedom is a protection that some librarians have as all similar to the other faculty on their campus. Some don't have it at all, <laughs> even though we are all academic librarians. Um, and for many, we just, we just don't know. It's unclear. And even when we try to look into it, it remains unclear. It's not always um, very easy to understand. Um, 
as Alexis demonstrated, there are um, there are unfortunately a lot of cases in the news, um, and we think it's useful to be um, starting to like pay attention to these with the concept of academic freedom in mind, um, and use these as a rallying point to inform your own actions or your own advocacy work. Um, one of the things that we the reasons we're writing a paper. Our next paper specifically about faculty status is there are a lot of interesting conversations about how academic freedom has been um, is, is primarily associated with and protected by tenure. And so I think that that um, for a lot of librarians like well I know that I'm not faculty I know that I don't have tenure so so I know I don't have academic freedom but we we don't want to stop the conversation there we think that we should be also kind of taking a step back or going a little deeper than that to say like what should we have in order to do our jobs the way we think that we need to um, and well again we have a lot more thoughts on that but not time to go into them here um, so we think um, we think it's just really important to make connections to other similar workers on your campus um, there are other people that are probably similar to librarians like Alexis mentioned educational technologists is one that comes to mind um, other adjunct faculty um, and together we think that we'll be able to advocate more effectively than um, than on our own Okay, sorry, I was on mute. Um, so, you know, beyond your local context, it's also really important for us to kind of widen the safety net in general. Um, and I did want to offer this caveat, and I think this speaks to my own story a little bit, but also that, um, you know, it's a, uh, it's a cliche, but it's a good one, which is to put your own mask on first. Um, how can you advocate for others if you get fired? Um, you have to be willing to speak up, but you also need to know what your risks are and to seek out allies who have more protections um, so that they can really advocate on your behalf when you're getting to a point where you're maybe having to cross a line that isn't safe for you. Um, and just knowing your own identity context as well. Like, I mean, some people can afford to get fired more than others in a lot of ways, right? Um, not that I want you to get fired. I don't want anybody to get fired, <laughs> but you know, I'm just saying, um, but I would say like the, a great place to start is your local library association, um, local meaning state usually, but, um, you know, being at this webinar might be a first step for a lot of folks, just as you know, you're obviously interested in it. And this is something that your library association is putting together. So this is exactly the kind of thing that I think people should be doing and having in-person conversations and often it's actually really important to have a lot of these conversations in person because all of that silencing and um, people being afraid to talk that is a little bit easier when you're in a personal setting um, it's also I think important to raise the profile of librarians within the broader academic association so the AUP I kind of alluded to this earlier but um, the Associate, American Association for University uh, Professors is, um, uh, they were huge champions of the UC librarians. Um, they could not believe that the chancellors didn't think that librarians need the protection. And having some uh, organization that has that much influence and power um, saying, proclaiming that that is something that librarians have, we should really leverage that. I mean, I don't know that we do um, that as much as we could. Um, and I would say, you know, you should look into the local chapter of AAUP. I feel like I just saw a comment popping up that maybe that people should mm -hmm. join it themselves. And I agree. Um, I think that we, um, you know, that, that chapter, depending on where you are, it might be on your campus. I know there's one here, but um, not that we haven't actually reached out to them yet ourselves. But, you know, do what I say, not <laughs> what I do. Um, and then, um, solidarity with other librarians so those stories that you're seeing that we're sharing that we're telling you about that you see on twitter that you see in you know newsletters that you might have um that you have that you read or listers or whatever um really show solidarity i think that we did an incredible job with that as a profession with the university of california librarians they had petitions people were signing them like crazy people were sharing stuff writing it up I thought that it just was really heartening to see that even though 
this is a group of librarians that probably have a lot more security and power than a lot of us do. And, and we were able to, to, to support that. And I think that's, um, I think it's great. I think what we need to do is do more of that for places where there isn't quite as much of that. Um, you know, that, that's a really large network um, with the union and a lot of people don't have any of that. So where we can do that for others, but of course taking their lead also, because I think there are times when maybe we want to advocate for folks and they're, the, what we're doing might actually be more damaging. So it's important to know what they really need and want. Um, and then I think we've mentioned this a couple of times in a couple of different ways, but I don't think you can emphasize it enough is to start seeing connections between disparate events. Um, it might not seem like um, my lab guide and the librarian at Holland's who wouldn't take down the yearbooks are have anything in common, but they do, right? Or that the UC librarians struggle and someone who put up a display that someone didn't like or don't have anything in common, but they do, right? And like the more we can think about them as connected events and connected experiences and through this lens of we should have the same kinds of protections as other educators on our campuses um, in order to do our job efficiently and not just efficiently, but well, um, I just don't think you can underestimate how important that is. So um, yeah, and I think that we're kind of, I think we're gonna leave it with that. Um, I, we're hoping that we're helping people see some of those disparate things as connected. Um, and we love to hear more about your experiences and your ideas and your questions. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. All right. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, thanks for that. That was really interesting. Um, and the examples, I think, were um, really helpful in some of your suggestions. So um, some of the questions that came in had to do with the survey that you talked about first and whether you um, analyzed the results according to gender roles or um, age at all because that may have affected the um, risk? Yeah, so yes, we do have that data. We have, um, we have looked at it ourselves quite a bit. Um, Alexis and I are um, more humanistically trained researchers who created a survey that's been hard for us to work with in all honesty so we've been getting some help on our campus from um, other um, more statistically expert people than ourselves um, so we do hope to share that i would say that um, a few previews um, are, are kind of sharing a little bit of some of what we learned that yes age did age did show up as um, as a differentiator um, and it showed up in the way that I think the question, I don't have it right in front of me, but I think the way that the question hypothesized, which was that um, we found in our survey respondents, older survey respondents felt more, I th correct me if I'm getting this wrong, Alexis, but I think they felt more free to express themselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I can't recall if they what their experiences were um, in general. This might be too sweeping of a statement for me to make make accurately, but in, in general, we saw bigger variations by socio demographic variable in the questions we asked about freedom of expression than in infringement, um, experiencing pushback or punishment or something like that. So that's been interesting. That's something we've really grappled with. But with age, yes. And and we, what we, um, when we ultimately share that in, in a more formal setting, one of the things that we've been thinking about is um, wanting to kind of unpack in our data. It's hard to pull out that age is partly like maybe people with more experience um, feel more safety because they have more experience maybe they feel more safety because their jobs are more secure maybe they feel more safety um, because they are more likely to have tenure um, or be faculty like we're not you know we we're not we and we may never we may not be able to establish that from our data but that's some of the things we're looking at and in gender we did look at gender I don't know that, um, so we did ask about that. Um, where we saw the, um, the biggest um, 
the biggest variations, and I think what were the most statistically significant, were in um, non-binary uh, genders. Is that, am I saying, like, am I recalling that correctly, Alexis? It was, um, yeah. we saw some different differences between respondents who who are men and respondents who are women um, and not quite how you'd expect <laughs> to see them actually yeah. Um, yeah. so that was interesting but mm -hmm. um, but we we saw more in people that do not um, that do that that um, are not um, that either are um, identify as non-binary or answer that in um, more than one category or I don't, I don't know um, how yeah, to speak, I mean, speak to it most accurately but yeah maybe I can add a little bit I think that the, one of the things that I recall and this is again like I, we really have to go back into our data but like the um, that there was a like I would say anyone who came from a marginalized community um, had higher had had a le was less likely to feel protected and in many many cases were also more likely to experience informal punishment and I have some theories about that that we definitely have not done the research on but I I think that in some ways that because informal punishment also a lot of the examples we gave for that I think were um, things that we might you might also identify as like microaggressions or things that are like the kind of informal punishments that people who already are used to being marginalized um, are more attuned to sometimes, you know, that they're the ones that are actually noticing um, those kinds of uh, being shut out or not getting the good, um, getting the same opportunities um, in ways that maybe some other groups are not necessarily seeing that. That doesn't mean it's not happening, but they don't necessarily, they're not as attuned to it as that's my theory, but that's just, you know, I don't have the, the, um, I can't say that from the data exactly, but that's something that I, I've thought a lot about the fact that, um, and it may be that, yeah, I don't know. I'm not an expert on that, but those are some of my thoughts about it at the moment. Yeah. And, um, and as far as men and women, um, what was interesting to see is that men, um, and again, I wish I had our data right in front of us to speak to this most accurately, but men were more likely, I think, than women in our respondents to say that they had ex experienced informal, like that they had experienced some um, pushback and um, felt less certain of their freedoms to speak up. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that that could be for any number of reasons, um, you know, partly like our I, I don't, you know, we have to spend more time with our data because I, about 75 to 80% of our respondents were, were women. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a little skewed in that way, just like our profession, we were very similar to the numbers in our profession. But I think there's all sorts of interesting ways to think about that. Um, and maybe we will be able to get at that better in interviews that we hope to do. Um, yeah. Okay, one other question was whether um, you separated the data between four-year and two-year schools and whether you saw any difference. We do have that. I don't recall. Um, I don't know that we actually look too deeply at what the differences might be. We definitely have the, we did ask that question. Yep. Um, but yeah. All right, um, there's a couple other comments in the uh, chat box that uh, I'm not sure <laughs> whether there's any answer about that right now, but um, whether you had any data about whether library directors defended librarians for punishment or join in the punishment. <laughs> we don't have that data. Um, it would be interesting to have. Uh, I agree. It's, a, it's a very interesting question, and um, and I mean, it would it would be a great project to gather the cases that are, have been written about in some way and kind of compile and study what happened. Um, but yeah, and, and I don't know, you know, offhand from the cases even that we've talked about. And I think like all of this, it's sort of nebulous, right? I mean, sometimes it's not, um, 
Sometimes it might be not the library director that's punishing the librarian, but it might be happening at a different level. Um, the defense just might be kind of uncertain. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that the other thing is uh, we, um, we do have some, we had an open-ended, um, like an open text field that people could fill in um, things. And one thing we did do is look, look at, well, in our new, our, I feel like I'm just plugging our paper now, but like, and our paper is coming out pretty soon, probably within the next month or so, um, month and a half, uh, that we, we did add some of the comments we got from folks. And there was quite a bit of commentary about experiences with supervisors yeah it wasn't clear to me whether we got a lot of comments from people who were supervisors um we didn't sort those comments that way but it, um but it was interesting to see like the kind people gave quite a few examples of ways that they had been um you know like denied research leaves and things like that because of what they were studying and various other things that was just one that came to mind mm -hmm. And I think the last comment has to says that it would be interesting to know how many institutions have a mix of faculty and um, non faculty MLSs mm -hmm. and whether that had any effect. Yeah, um, and we we in our research didn't ask about kind of the mix at people's institutions, but I feel I think that there's been some interesting research done on this question recently mm -hmm. um, and sort of uh, I believe an emerging area of research, um, maybe not into academic freedom specifically, but um, but what that means for our libraries when you you're adding a whole nother kind of employment class and um, or you have faculty librarians who are tenured and faculty librarians who are annual appointment, which I think is on the rise, I believe, mm -hmm. of that that kind of mix. And well, that's Oh, go ahead. I was going to one one thing about that is like we you know like that kind of goes back to that age question again too because um, that I, I mean my experience has been that when there are faculty librarians and then staff it's usually the people who have been there for thirty five years that are faculty because they were faculty before we switched over to only ha having staff or something like that um, and so that may also play into that age thing in terms of feeling protected because they just are more protected right so yeah that's a really good point um and then another comment uh that just came in was whether the librarians have a separate employment contract different from what faculty have and whether if they were under the faculty contract whether that made a difference yeah, I think that's a super interesting question. Um, we, I've looked into the, the ACRL does collect statistics, um, as you all know, I'm sure, from um, at an institutional level, and they do ask some questions about, um, like, not only whether or not librarians are faculty or not on, at an institution, but kind of they break it down into all these specific rights that faculty have typically, do librarians have that at your, you know, and it's interesting to see the disparity between those numbers, like librarians might be faculty, but then they don't have um, nine month contracts, they don't have the right to a research leave. Um, when I've looked at those statistics, librarians seem more likely to have academic freedom than some of the other, according to the person answering the survey for the institution, than some of the other rights that are um, unpacked from the broader faculty status. But, um, but but again, like not to muddy the waters, but it goes back to sort of the points we keep making, which is that I'm not sure we can always trust that we know whether or not we have academic freedom. Like I think some, some of what's interesting here is that we've been operating under some assumptions that we do. And then we what we've been hearing, um, we saw in our research, but we've, we've been hearing and noticing are these cases where um, it becomes clear that, that we don't. We had a, a Faculty, a, a librarian reach out to us after our first iteration of our research came out to let us know his story of losing faculty status at their institution um, and what a surprise you know the whole process had been and how shocking to kind of to lose something like that that they had been counting on and, and how that all unfolded so it was great I just want to comment it was really great to see in the chat um, all the the support for the AAUP and um, mm -hmm. I think we've been really realizing that this is 
creating those alliances is really important. Mm -hmm. um, on my own campus, I'm um, I'm going to be joining the the faculty senate um, committee on academic freedom um, in the this summer with the new academic year, and I'm. I, I reached out and kind of followed that path because of the research that we've been doing. Um, they have, it's, you know, like all of this, it's, it's not a balanced committee. I think it's like nine to 10 traditional faculty and then there's room for some folks like us. Um, but I'm excited just to have a seat at the table and, and learn more. Um, and I, it wasn't quite as hard as I thought to, to kind of make my way onto it. I mean, it took about a year to kind of figure out the bureaucracy and, and volunteer and be accepted. But, um, but that goes back to kind of this direction that we're trying to take our research into speaking about it as an applied way is, yeah, as I see someone commenting, it's important to be aware of political wins and, and that local governance, um, where, where can you advocate for yourself? And I have come from, uh, you know, at my previous institution, there wouldn't have been a way I would not have been able to participate on a committee like that. Um, so I know that's not an option for everyone, but again, we've got to do what we can where we can. Mm -hmm. I think that will be a great um, opportunity to connect with um, those conversations on campus and be a part of it. Yeah, I hope no. so. <laughs> yeah. And of course, I'm nervous. I'm like, I don't, you know, what, what, am, what am I going to be willing to say in that context and advocate for? But, you know, I, I mean, I've got to use the protections that I think I have. So Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So um, Dana and Alexis, thank you for so much for sharing with us today. And thanks to all the participants as well. I hope everyone will take a few moments to complete our evaluation form and let us know your thoughts about the presentation and about our programming in general. The link for the survey will be in the chat box. Um, if you registered for a group, you'll receive an email with a link to the survey. And if you would, please share the link. Again, the feedback we receive helps us determine in what directions to take our programming. As a reminder, the recording of this presentation will be shared to those who registered, so feel free to forward it and on the CRD blog. And the link to the blog was, um, Aaron had it at the beginning of the um, chat box. Uh, if you are not a Pennsylvania Library Association member and you are interested in becoming a member, please feel free to email Erin Burns at emb28 at psu.edu and she'll have the appropriate person contact you. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you all Thank so you much. All. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.